Good morning, and welcome to the Fuel Cell Seminar and Exposition 2011, celebrating its 35th year. Introducing the Technical Planning Committee co-chair, Maria Medeiros, from the Office of Naval Research. Good morning. I, will, I would like to welcome the distinguished guests here this morning, our award winners and our fuel cell seminar attendees to the two, uh, 211 fuel cell seminar and exposition. As the voice said, my name is Maria Medeiros and I'm from the Office of Naval Research and I'm here today with Do uh, Dr. Michelle Anderson also from the Office of Naval Research and we've had the opportunity to co-chair this year's Technical Program Committee and it is our pleasure to welcome you to Orlando. So this year celebrates the 35th anniversary of the Fuel Cell Seminar and the Fuel Cell Seminar as you know is a forum for researchers and developers to share new findings, new ideas, stories, uh, success stories, and lessons learned within the fuel cell community. And the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar theme this year was today's safe, clean, and sustainable power. And this year's uh, seminar emphasizes the role that the seminar plays in securing our energy future and also our extensive te technical program and exposition will showcase the import importance of fuel cells and the development of energy strategies for a cleaner future. I would like to take this opportunity, Michelle and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the technical program committee members who very dil diligently selected uh, from hundreds of abstracts the technical program that you are about to uh, be witness to this year. Um, it's going to be an exciting three days and it promises to be filled with presentations and discussions for over, from over 20 different countries. We also would like to thank the board of directors, the sponsors and the exhibitors the uh, short course instructors that took place uh, yesterday, and the uh, day trip. Uh, we had a day trip yesterday um, to the Florida Solar Center and Space Coast Solar Energy Center, and I've, I've heard very positive feedback from that trip. It was very well received, and we, can, we would like to continue to do day trips, uh, if possible, in the future uh, seminars. We also would like to thank the management group of the South Carolina Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Alliance, uh, especially Nancy for all of her hard work in putting this together, which is not an easy task. And of course, we'd like to thank you for this year's attendance and participation in this year's seminar. And now, Dr. Michelle Anderson, my co-chair, will highlight some of this year's key features of the Technical Program Committee. And please remember to silence your cell phones and pagers. Thank you. Technical Planning Committee Co-Chair, Michelle Anderson from the Office of Naval Research. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the session chairs and presenters who attended the speaker's breakfast this morning. And I want to remind the speakers and session chairs for Wednesday and Thursday to attend their uh, session chair breakfast on those days, the morning of their session. Uh, I'd also like to ask all of the attendees to fill out the survey that's in your packet. We really want your feedback. We want to continue uh, to make this the premier fuel cell meeting uh, and to continue to improve it in any way that we can. Uh, it's my pleasure. There are really a lot of exciting activities this week. Uh, there's a lot of information in the program, so I encourage everybody to go through it. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to the concurrent technical sessions, I'd like to highlight some of those uh, premier activities that we have going on, and the details of all of those can be found in your program book. Uh, this morning's plenary session features the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar and Expedi Exposition Award winners, 
each of whom has significantly contributed to the development and commercialization of fuel cells and fuel cell technology. At 11.30 today, the Baker Awards Luncheon uh, will recognize our student award winners. Uh, and these are students who have demonstrated exceptional capability and future potential in fuel cell and fuel cell related technologies. Um, we're going to close out today from 5 to 7 p.m. with the opening of the exhibit hall, the formal poster session, which will also be in the exhibit hall, and a welcoming reception sponsored by Clean Energy, Toyota, and the USC City of Columbia Fuel Cell Collaborative. Uh, so we invite you to come down, have some refreshments, and visit the exhibitors and the posters. The posters and the exhibits in the exhibit hall will be open through 1.30 on Thursday. So there's lots of time this week in addition to this evening to go uh, visit the posters and the exhibitors, and we encourage everyone to do that. Uh, tomorrow's agenda, uh, Wednesday morning, features an end-user plenary session that's focused on end-user testimonials and various types of funding that uh, is going on to encourage and accelerate commercialization of the technology. Also tomorrow uh, at noon, the Women in Fuel Cells Luncheon uh, will be held. You can purchase tickets at the registration desk and everybody's welcome. It's not just for women, men attend the luncheon also. Uh, and it'll be a very nice event. The poster award winners will be announced tomorrow at 3.30 uh, p.m. during the break. So we encourage everyone to attend that and to go check out which posters received awards. The industry reception will be at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. This will include a backyard barbecue and open bar. It's sponsored by Clean Energy, Green Light Innovation, Toyota, and the Ohio Department of Development. So that's another great opportunity to come out and mingle and discuss fuel cells with everyone who's participating in the conference. Uh, finally, uh, Thursday is our hydrogen day, a specifically themed day that's going to start off with a plenary that spans hydrogen fuel cell applications and the state of the industry. Uh, the concurrent technical sessions on that day are also focused on hydrogen. Um, this is a uh, very key area for fuel cells in general. And there's a very active hydrogen community, so we hope everybody enjoys this specially themed day. Uh, this promises to be a very stimulating meeting. Uh, I'd really like to thank everyone for their participation uh, <clears throat> and all of their work in making this meeting happen uh, and making it a success. The, the Dolphin and Orlando, Florida have really been a wonderful venue for this meeting. They've been very welcoming and accommodating. And it's my pleasure to now introduce Carolyn Martin from Visit Orlando. From Visit Orlando, Carolyn Martin. Good morning. It's an honor for me to be here this morning and share of what some of Orlando offers. We appreciate you coming to our beautiful city and hope you enjoy your stay. Orlando offers a unique and perfect blend of attractions and entertainment guaranteed to provide a lifetime of priceless memories. From heart pounding rides at the world famous theme parks, beautiful botanical gardens and outdoor adventures, to sizzling nightlife, enriching performing arts, and sensational shopping. Orlando is an ideal location to combine business with fun. As you know, Orlando is home to major theme parks, Walt Disney World, Universal Orlando, SeaWorld Orlando, and Discovery Cove, a reservation-only park where you can swim with dolphins. Each theme park offers fun for all ages, complemented by an inviting assortment of other on-property venues, such as themed water parks, shopping districts, and nighttime entertainment complexes. For the first time, guests can visit the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Orlando Resort and stroll the streets of Hogsmeade, exploring the sights and sounds of magical wonders and experience thrilling rides and attraction that bring the adventures of Harry Potter and his friends to life. The excitement, however, doesn't stop at the major theme parks. There are more than 80 other attractions in the Orlando area. You can defy gravity at Wonderworks, have a close-up encounter with alligators at Gatorland, meet an astronaut at Kennedy Space Center, 
and stroll through the largest camellia collection in, and formal rose garden in the South at Harry P. Lou Gardens. You can also play a round of golf on one of more than 125 pristine golf courses within the Central Florida area, or relax at one of the area's luxurious spas. Not many people know that nestled among Orlando's famous attraction is a shopper's haven, offering everything from outlet centers to upscale boutiques and antique shops. After shopping, relax and taste the superb cuisine at one of Orlando's world-renowned restaurants, including many local favorites. And don't think the fun stops at night. From downtown Orlando to Universal City Walk, you will find a variety of evening activities. As you can see, Orlando has a lot to offer you. With so many spectacular options, you are only limited by your imagination. Thank you for attending the Fuel Cell Seminar, and welcome to Orlando. President of Logan Energy Corporation and Chairman of the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Board of Directors. Well, with that introduction, I'm tempted to launch into a Bill Cosby monologue, but I'll spare you that. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. I have the great pleasure of recognizing our TPC co-chairs, <clears throat> Maria and Michelle. They've really put out an extraordinary effort. They've worked very hard. Your leadership has helped prepare us for this great occasion. We thank you very much. I'd also like to extend great thanks to Keith Spitznagel, who's the chairman of the Market and Applications uh, Committee for the seminar, and the one largely responsible for organizing the exhibit hall. I'd like to ask you all a round of applause for these folks and all the work that they've done. Thank you all for your time and your talents and all of your support. Uh, I'll just take a moment now, and I'd like to introduce our board. I'm sure most of the folks on our board are familiar faces for most of you, but just in case they're not, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Mark Williams. Mark, there, stand up, please. Um, Mark, I know, is very familiar to all of you all. Uh, he was uh, formerly the fuel cell technical manager at DOE, and now he is uh, director of research at URS. And uh, next to me here is Larry Blair. Larry, he serves as the treasurer of the board. Uh, Larry was, uh, had a 37-year career at Los Alamos. Uh, now he's a private consultant to DOE in uh, fuel cell activities and also in hydrogen storage. And next, I'd like to introduce Erin Lane, who is our treasurer. Uh, she is currently a VP at Cascade Associates, and she uh, works very closely with energy efficiency and distributed generation companies. Uh, next, uh, Mike Hicks. Is Mike here? Mike? Thank you, Mike. Mike serves as our uh, representative from the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Alliance, where he is the current president of that organization and provides uh, us with a great deal of interaction and cooperation with, with that organization. He is currently the engineer manager of technology and development at Ida Tech. And next, I'd like to introduce Shannon Baxter Clemens. She brings her expertise from us as Executive Director of the South Carolina Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Alliance. And the Alliance also uh, directs the planning and the pr production of this conference. And we are very, very fortunate to have her staff uh, in that regard. I'd also like to introduce Frank Wallach, who is our newest member of the board. He's Vice President of Business at Fuel Cell Energy. You can recognize all of the board members. We have a little black badge, just like this. So if you have any questions, please stop us wherever we are. Ask away. Tell us what's on your mind. We're anxious to hear from you. So let me just have a round of applause for our board and all the hard work that they do. Thank you. 
I also want to thank Toyota, who's our gold sponsor. I want to thank the Connecticut Clean Energy and Finance Investment Authority, Department of Energy, and the South Carolina Hydrogen Fuel Cell Alliance, who are our silver sponsors, and we are greatly indebted to them for their support. Uh, it's already been said that this is our 35th anniversary conference, and in a very grand setting indeed. But if you look back to the summer of 1976, at the very first organization of the seminar, those beginnings were very humble compared to what we have today. In fact, it was attended by uh, 170 individuals that took place in Palo Alto, California. And the seminar started <clears throat> as a DOE-sponsored gathering of fuel cell researchers and enthusiasts. The purpose was to coordinate many disparate efforts uh, to capture the benefits of fuel, fuel cell technology for a cleaner and more efficient, cost-effective energy economy. And those early go goals included to create a cooperative network of researchers and students and industry leaders to advance the promise and the future of fuel cells, uh, to promote technical excellence in research and product development, recognize researchers for outstanding contributions to fuel cell science and technology, and to educate energy industry and energy consumers with technical presentations and demonstrations. Today's seminar embraces those same values, but today the seminar has evolved from just a small gathering into a, a nonprofit organization with a governing board and a real mission as putting it as simply as I can, I would state that mission is to promote the industry in every way we can to greater growth and help every, all the industry capture that magic word profitability. Somewhat elusive word, but out there nevertheless. So as a, in retrospect, we, we're so grateful for DOE, to DOE for shepherding the seminar through its early years. And our board is ever mindful of this very strong legacy uh, when it was just a very nascent industry, practically no industry outside of, the la outside of laboratories. But today there are scores of industry players, including OEMs, many, many supply chain and component manufacturers, service and engineering companies, professional consultants, policy advisors, and many national and state organizations all pulling together to make this a successful industry. And just in the last decade, this industry has moved beyond a very narrow range of products to many, many diverse products and applications ranging from sub-kilowatts to multi-megawatt stationary portable motive systems across the entire fuel cell technology spectrum. Increasingly and importantly, these products are registering high marks for customer satisfaction by proving themselves safe, reliable, and certifiably green. With such a strong legacy and a solid industrial footing, the Fuel Cell Seminar is looking to the future with a broader plan, a larger plan, to really promote products, suppliers, and help develop markets. And we're going to launch this new vision seriously with a convention at the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut next year, which in the state, which is essentially the crucible of the fuel cell industry in the United States. And we'll be partnering with the Connecticut Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority and the Fuel Cell Hydrogen and Energy Sim um, Association to plan a new seminar with a real focus on products, markets, applications, fuels, manufacturing, and all with the intent of attracting consumers and end users to come to learn and to bring their checkbooks. Before closing, I want to thank 
all of you all for being here, for coming to Orlando this year, and also offer special thanks to our loyal exhibitors and a welcome aboard to our new ones. I'm also very grateful to all of our poster presenters. It's an outstanding poster show this year. It's the largest I believe I've ever seen. And none of this would have been possible without all of you, and we're so grateful that you're here. If you've not done so already, please study the conference guide. As Marie said, our planners have once again assembled an exciting program that covers in great depth just about every fuel cell topic that might interest you. So enjoy yourselves, greet old friends, network with new ones, learn all you can, dial up your enthusiasm, recharge your batteries. No, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> but, but leave here, leave here, excited for the future of our industry eager to pursue its success, and committed to do so. Thank you very much. Mark Williams, Energy System Dynamics and URS Corporation, and Vice President of the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Board of Directors. <clears throat> I'd like to personally thank Sam for all the support he gives the fuel cell industry and, and for, his, uh, for his attitude. He's truly a southern gentleman and very amiable person. Um, we would like now to make the announcements for the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Awards. Uh, two Lifetime Achievement Awards are giving, given each year. And this year, the award winners are Dr. Harumi Yokokawa and Mr. Adrian Corliss, Chief Technology Officer and VP at Plug Power. Dr. Yokokawa is truly deserving. He, uh, he received his master's and doctor degrees in engineering from Japan's premier university, University of Tokyo. In uh, 1995, he became the group leader of the Energy Related Materials Group in NIMC, the National Institute for Materials and Chemical Research. In 2011, NIMC and other national institutes uh, belonging to the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MIDI, which most, many of you may be familiar with, formed a new institute, namely the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, AIST. And from 2001 to 2004, he served as deputy director as, as well as group leader for the Energy Electronics Institute at AIST. And from 2004 to 2009, he served as the principal research scientist and group leader there. After retirement from AIST, he continues to act as the project leader of the NEDO SOSC degradation project as an invited research scientist. Dr. Yokokawa has written some 400 papers and given 83 international and more than 34 domestic invited presentations. His main work has been in the area of thermodynamics. He developed the thermodynamic database and was awarded the uh, Information Center for Science and Technology Award from the Scuba Foundation for Chemistry and Biotechnology in 1997 for his work. And recently, he was acknowledged uh, by the S Society Award from the Japanese Society of Calorimetry and Thermal Analysis for his construction and dissemination of the thermodynamic program MALT. He was awarded the Outstanding Achievement Award from the High Temperature Materials Division of the Electrochemical Society. In, 19, in 2006, he was made a Fellow of the Electrochemical Society. And recently, Dr. Yokokawa and his group were awarded the Christian Friedreich Schoenbein Contribution for Science Award for the outstanding contribution to the understanding of the fundamentals of solid oxide fuel cells for the European Fuel Cell Forum. It is with great pleasure and respect that we award Dr. Yokokawa the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Award.
Thank you very much. It is my great honor and uh, pleasure to have uh, this kind of uh, important award. So uh, today, I would like to give you some talks on what I did in the field of the SOC and uh, its relation to uh, industrial effort to uh, develop in the SOC stacks uh, and in systems. This is. No, 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 no. I'm so, this is so, what is? This one. Okay. 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 Yeah, thank you. Uh, this shows that some variety of the SOC system and materials and Usually, we divided into three generations. First generation was developed some 20 years ago by Western House. At that time, uh, uh, they adopted the electrochemical deposition technique. This is a very, very nice technique to produce uh, uh, high performance cells, and the durability of that cell was excellent. More than 70,000 hours uh, lifetime can be achieved, just one trial. So at that time, uh, but this electrochemical deposition technique cost you very much. So uh, technical target at that time was to reduce the fabrication cost. So next second generation uh, started after knowing these issues in the first generation. So they start with well, cost-effective fabrication pro processes. So target of the second generation is to achieve the uh, durabilities because uh, in order to, to uh, realize uh, high performance at the lower temperatures, we needed to use uh, high active materials but uh, uh, more reactive materials. So we have the uh, durability issues in the second generation. Recently, uh, people started to work on the third generation. This is based on the metal support cells. So this is more uh, it only, only, uh, designed to, to operate at lower temperatures. So today, I just talk about uh, fast issues uh, cathode electrolytes uh, interface issues at the first generations. So when I started the work on a solid oxide fuel cell, at that time already Westinghouse developed the uh, sealess tubular design, but uh, they want to reduce uh, fabrication cost. To do so, most uh, effective way is to adopt a, a, a wet sintering process. To achieve this method, we needed to know the material behavior at high temperatures. Among them, uh, cathode electrolyte interface and lanthanum chromate is the two major issues. For cathode electrolyte interfaces, uh, we know that, uh, for example, Uh, on the right hand side, uh, lanthanum cobalt uh, perovskite oxide was known as a very active material for catalytic purpose. But uh, soon it's well known that uh, it reacted with the uh, zirconium oxide electrolyte to, to completely destroy it. For the case of the lanthanum manganite, we have some good interfaces sometimes, but we have some lanthanum zircon formation other cases. So uh, we would like to know what happened on the interface between the lanthanum manganite based cathode and the YSF electrolyte. First, we can say that uh, lanthanum manganite does not take place a complete destruction as a result of the YSZ. So we can deny the first cases. Second cases, lanthanum manganite can react with the YSZ to form only lanthanum zirconate. In this 
uh, reaction, uh, zirconium component in the YSZ turned to be a lanthanum zirconate. Lanthanum zirconate is a non electrical property, so this is a blocking for the oxygen flow. So we have to avoid the formation of lanthanum zirconate. In this equation, we can also recognize that the manganese balance states may change on reaction. So we needed to have the oxygen gases as the reactant. So this is very important features. So oh, for example, uh, uh, when we have the formation of lanthanum zirconate at the interface, doesn't work. Uh, oxygen comes through to a reaction point in the form of the oxide ion and also electrons. So in the electrolytes, this is a, we have a good pass for oxygen ion. In the electrode, we have a good pass for uh, electrons. So always we have the reaction uh, point at the interfaces. Okay. And uh, if after knowing that uh, what kind of chemical reaction is, is dominant in the I interface, we can calculate where lanthanum zirconate formed as a function of the uh, electrode composition. At that time, industrial people are looking for uh, some optimized composition for cathode materials. And uh, there was uh, two major groups. One is the Wasim Haas. They adopted uh, lanthanum strontium manganite uh, electrodes as, as for a fear cell mode. And also, uh, at that time, Dornier in Germany looked for uh, oxygen electrodes for uh, electrolyzers. They come to the composition of lanthanum calcium manganite. Okay? They are uh, looking for independently, so they lead it to the different composition. So I calculate where, in what composition, lanthanum zirconate is formed. So upper triangle is that region. It is very interesting to note that the Dornier composition is outside of the lanthanum zirconate formation region, but the Western House composition is inside of the lanthanum zirconate formation region. So this means that uh, in uh, uh, electrolyzer mode, lanthanum zirconate becomes very, very severe. On the other hand, in a fuel cell mode, lanthanum zirconate cannot be so serious. Why not? This is because of the change in uh, oxygen pro potential profile in the vicinity of the cathode interface region. Okay. As I said before, in order to formation of the lanthanum zirconate at the interface, we needed to have the oxygen as a reactant. But we have the flow of the oxide ion in the vicinity of the uh, cathode electrolyte interface. Particularly when you make a cathodic polarization, our interface becomes reductive. Reductive means that uh, we uh, thinking about uh, this lanthanum zirconate formation, this is oxidative reaction. So, uh, backward reaction may occur. This means that uh, lanthanum zirconate started to move out of the interface region. So, after 24-hour operation, people in uh, uh, Stanford University, no, 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 Cambridge University, can find out a uh, change in the morphology like this. Okay. Uh, later, in a Siemens at the Munich site, also made a detailed analysis on their cells after operating a uh, long term period of time. And and they started from the nominal composition of the lanthanum manganite. 
and they found out uh, by TM technique to find out that uh, there is no lanternum zirconate anymore, but uh, lanternum manganite becomes a site deficient. So this means that uh, during the operation time, uh, some microstructure may change to keep the stable uh, contact between two materials. So from this fact, we can interpret that the uh, uh, Western House cell uh, shows some improvement at the beginning of the time, like this. This can be interpreted as a result of the reconstruction of the interface to remove the lanternum zirconate and uh, to keep the lanternum uh, A-side deficient lanternum uh, manganite. So this is the reason why uh, this Westinghouse composition can be used as a fuel cell uh, mode. On the other hand, uh, Dornier worked first on uh, uh, electrolyzer mode. In electrolyzer mode, uh, current flow it's completely opposite to the fuel cell mode. So this means that the interface becomes quite oxidative. Sometimes oxygen potential at interface becomes above the one atmosphere. This means that the oxygen evolution may occur at the interface. So this is one of the reasons why fuel uh, extra mode people experience the delamination of the lanternum manganite electrolyte from the electrolyte. So in order to, to avoid this kind of the delamination, we should take the composition outside of the lanternum zirconate. In that sense, uh, two activities in Dornier and in Westinghouse give us a good example how Lanternum zirconate formation properties govern the mass transfer or cell performance in the vicinity of the cathode and electrolytes. Okay. So this is my first work in the beginning of the SOC uh, field. So some 20 years later, we started the uh, NED project to uh, uh, to make uh, cooperation between uh, industries and uh, public institutes and uh, universities. So AST make uh, some leadership to, to, to cooperate some, uh, for that kind of the things. And uh, we have uh, initially four industrial partners they have their own uh, stack design, they have their own materials, and they have their own applications. So it's quite a uh, variety. But uh, they operated their own stacks, for example, for uh, 5,000 hours. And after the uh, stack operation, uh, we uh, dissected those materials into several pieces. And, uh, ASD people uh, make detailed analysis on that uh, materials. And this kind of procedure is very useful to extract the issues in the stack levels, not in the cell levels. So in this NED project, we have uh, two industry partners. One is the MHI, and the other one is the TOTO. Both industrial developers adopt and then a manganite cathode in their stack. Total adopt essentially the same composition as Western Haas or the Western Haas cathode. And MIT, uh, MHI, adopt a combination of the uh, calcium dope and the strontium codop system, where they make use of the two layers structures for both materials. And 
This is a uh, short summary of the of the uh, long-term uh, durability test. Uh, Toto succeeded in fabricating the cathode, lanternum fluid magnet cathode by wet sintering process, and they achieved a very, very low durability for cathode. But still, they have some issues in a cath uh, anode and electrolyte. Uh, MHI uh, adopted two different kinds of the cathode structures. First one, they had some troubles in cathode degradation, but after they changed the two-layer structure to, to uh, use of the doctor's serial interlayer system. So after that, they had a very nice uh, uh, durability, like that, uh, like uh, essentially zero degradation during the 1,000 hours. So this is uh, their results. Initially, they have some degradation in the, in the level of the 1% per thousand hours, but recently, essentially, no degradation occur. Okay, so in that sense, they uh, succeeded in fabricating a uh, cathode, uh, uh, magnetic-based cathode cell by a wet sintering process. So they achieved some cost target and they achieved some some durability target, and they achieve some performance target. Okay. So this is, again, I show you some three generation pictures. And uh, as I said before, we have very variety of the cell design, cell materials, and the strategy for operation. And with decrease in the temperatures, we have to recognize that uh, uh, kinetic factors may dominant, and the uh, things related with the degradation becomes more complicated and complicated. And in order to know those things, we needed more times and more fundamental work. So still, we think that uh, uh, equivalent properties give you some fast basis to understand a correlation between the uh, equilibrium and kinetic factors. So. I would like to continue this kind of the work in, um, until near future to, to uh, achieve some commercialization even in a second generation or third generation. Okay. Uh, acknowledgement is um, all my colleagues in AISTs and we have many industrial partners in Japan and also we have some good partners with uh, universities. And finally, I would like to sincere thanks to uh, Dr. Mark Williams and Dr. Sebastian Singers. They always encourage me to do this kind of the work. Thank you for your attention. Let's welcome Shannon Baxter Clemens from the South Carolina Hydrogen Fuel Cell Alliance and a member of the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Board of Directors. Good morning, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Wake up, dudes. All right, congratulations, Yoko Kawasan. That's incredible. And Mark Williams was explaining to me just how important your work is uh, in Japan and in the US, and I appreciate you being here today. Uh, my great honor today is to hand out the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Award for efforts in commercialization in fuel cells. And I think this, the way that we're doing the awards this year signifies um, a signal that, that Sam was talking about earlier today is that Fuel Cell Seminar is continuing to put the emphasis on the technical program and on the research that's important to commercializing fuel cells but we're also looking at more about uh, bringing in potential customers to talk to the companies and, uh, and those supply chain members that are part of the commercialization of fuel cells. And also you'll notice that there's a, a bigger embrace of hydrogen this year, recognizing that those are the early fuel cells that are being commercialized, are the hydrogen fuel cells. And our next award winner has quite a bit to do with that. Um, Adrian Corliss and I have known each other for quite some time. I don't know if 
uh, I was in California working at the California Air Resources Board starting in 1999, and I was out there with the California Environmental Protection Agency through uh, late 2006. And so back in um, the early part of the century, uh, Adrian and I used to work together. I was working uh, with the Air Resources Board on the zero emission bus regulations, and he was working for Ballard uh, on the buses. And so they would bring the buses down to California, and they would show us how you could pull the stacks out on either side, and then you could work on them. And, you know, I didn't really know a lot about buses back then, but it was still pretty exciting stuff that we could talk about these buses and we could point to real world applications of fuel cells. We didn't just have to talk about things that were uh, in, the, in the lab anymore. So we were working with that and those guys would come down and they would show off the buses and, uh, and buses are a big deal in California because uh, of the environment and uh, because of the pollution that they would put out. And then Adrian moved over to a company called Celex, and he started Celex with a couple of other guys from Ballard, uh, Chris Reed and Mike Brown. They started this in, in early uh, 2000. And I remember sitting in a meeting at the California EPA building in Sacramento, and uh, Alan Lloyd was there, who was the chairman of the of the car, uh, the Air Resources Board, and some other staff folks. And Adrian and his colleagues are telling us about forklifts. <laughs> and I remember sitting there, and I worked with the California Fuel Cell Partnership. So we worked with cars, and we worked with buses. We worked with sexy stuff. We worked on pollution and, you know, improving the world. And Adrian, these guys are telling me about forklifts. Well, I don't know anything about forklifts at the time. I don't know how to drive one. I don't know where to get one. I, I don't know anything about forklifts. And I can't really grasp how this is such a big deal. But they were sure that this was a big deal. And as time went on, I started to realize that what I didn't get, that Adrian and his folks were visionaries. They had found one of the places where hydrogen and, fuel cell v, uh, hydrogen fuel cells were going to meet a market value proposition. And so now, several years later and a little bit wiser, I get it, okay? So there's thousands of these forklifts out there now that are out there without government subsidies. They take the tax credits, but they don't have uh, anything else, you know, outside of BMW, they buy these forklifts and they use them, and then they rave about them. So in South Carolina, we've got Bridgestone Firestone, Michelin is looking at them, uh, uh, Genco from, um, that operates the Kimberly-Clark facility, BMW, and there are more coming online. So there are hundreds of these forklifts in South Carolina. So Plug Power, uh, when I think they were struggling a little bit, they recognized the vision of Celex and acquired Celex. And now this is, of course, is one of the things that Plug Power, one of the, the two things that I can think of right off, that Plug Power is best known for. And Adrian is now their chief technology officer. And so this is so important, not just to researchers, not to people in commercialization, but folks like Aaron Lane and myself that do a lot of work with policymakers and decision makers. Because we can say, we can point to a hydrogen fuel cell that is in operation. We can take decision makers, whether they've got a forklift operator's license or not, and let them see one being fueled and see it being used in a warehouse that contains a lot of their voters, their constituents, and uh, companies that support them and, and care about the decisions they're making. So this is just plain huge. And I still remember sitting in that conference room and going, what the heck are these guys talking about? So I just have a huge amount of respect for Adrian, his, um, his opinions, his vision, and the work that he's done. Uh, just for the record, he's an active participant in the Industrial Truck Association, an executive board member of the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association, a technical advisory board member for the NRC Institute for Fuel Cell Innovation, and a member of both UL and CSA Standards Development Committees. So he's a little bit busy. 
Mr. Corliss holds a Master's of Applied Science degrees in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Victoria and is a registered professional engineer in British Columbia, Canada. And so it is, again, my great honor to present this award to Adrian Corliss. Please welcome him to the stage. Thanks a lot, Shannon. That was a really nice introduction. I think I just leave on a high note now, but I prepared a lot of pages. So again, uh, thanks very much. It's really great to be here, great to be amongst my friends and colleagues here. It's uh, probably for me about my 10th seminar. Uh, and I also want to just thank the selection committee for, for choosing me. And I, and I figure, again, that what it really indicates is it's a change that I think a lot of us have been waiting for for a long time. And it's, a, it's a change which means that you know, fuel cells really are now part of our commercial industry. And, and I think that fuel cell product successes now are starting to define our industry as much as the technical achievements have over the last, uh, the last several years. So, I mean, anybody who knows me knows I'm really passionate about fuel cells. In particular, I'm really passionate about the, the systems engineering of fuel cells. And what that means is building the layers around the technology that allows us to, to deal with some of the issues, but more importantly, to create a, a useful end product that the customers can gain value from. And a lot of times that means actually masking the technology that's inside of that. So today I can certainly say, and I actually have just one slide because Shannon told me yesterday I could bring slides, so you're gonna be spared a long PowerPoint. But I wanted to share this one slide because I think it gives a really important and powerful message. And the message is really that customers today have embraced the technology and they're starting to adopt this technology and their adoption is starting to accelerate. So this is a really neat slide because what it does really say though is that we really have entered into a new phase. And I'm gonna talk about material handling because it's what I know, but I know that this is being seen in, in a lot of other or sorry, applications around the industry. So the other thought I want everyone to take away, and this is kind of a neat thing, is that Today, there's a momentum that exists in material handling, which to me means that it's, it's pretty much inevitable that fuel cells are gonna grow to dominate this market. And I think you know, that concept of inevitably, inevitability of success is something which is a real paradigm shift and something that's really new for me even, having worked for the last 15 years as a product development guy in fuel cells. So uh, Shannon had asked me to share some of my past and current experiences about how did we actually get here to this commercial success from the beginnings of the product development process. And so I'm gonna to try to explain with the help of a couple concepts. And you know, I borrowed these concepts, so I, I uh, thank those who gave them for me, to me. But the two concepts I'm gonna use are, are island hopping, and the second was getting to your happy place. I'll get to that. So, so the first concept is, is island hopping, and about 10 years ago, was an engineer, a product development guy from GM explained this to me, and I apologize, I, I don't remember exactly who it was, but, but the concept refers to a strategy where if you've got a journey that's too long to make in one go, you need to break that journey up in small enough pieces so you can actually show a series of successes and actually maintain your momentum as you're trying to get to your final goal. And so we applied that to the process of product development you know, and the fuel cells. And, and really the very first thing you have to do is you have to set the course right. And so going back as early as 1998, we would go and meet with customers and really try to understand what their needs were and really try to understand if we could bridge that gap with fuel cell technology. And in about 2000, we were actually able to go and then take technology to the customers for the first time and actually gauge the response to it. And what we found in, in, in about mid-2000 was that there really was a customer in the other side of the ocean. There really was an, an end goal that was worth getting to. So what we went then was really, it was really a long process, much longer, I think, than any of us expected it to be. But there was a series of island hops we had to go through, which were really around technology development, technology validation, and development of the supply chain. So along that way, it wasn't a linear process. We had a lot of setbacks, and at one point we really almost didn't make it. We almost, we almost sunk, and there was a really tough day back in 2004 where we missed a real critical milestone, 
And in that day, we actually went from about 70 people in our organization down to around 14. And it was, it was really tough, but, but it was what we had to do to survive. And, and what we did at that point there, again, was just to set more achievable and smaller goals, but, but keeping in mind that it was a customer that was setting our direction. So by keeping in mind the needs of the customers, it kept us moving in the right direction. So fast forwarding to 2009, I'd say it was about the first time we actually sighted shore on the other side, and you know, instead of seeing angry natives on the shore, we actually saw customers, and, and those customers actually were the first customers who were willing to actually buy our products on commercial terms. And I think this marks really a change, and it was the beginning of a customer engagement phase, and it was really where we started to search for the happy place. So, you know, during this transi transition, I've also really seen a change in how actually the work environment works. And, and I think one, one example is in the past, in the engineering environment, and the vocabulary we used to use, it was really a lot around you know, planning project demonstrations. It was a lot about really trying to understand failure mechanisms and mitigation strategies. And, and today, actually, the vocabulary is very different. It's really all about product launches. It's about product margins and, and launch schedules and material management. Uh, in the past, with our suppliers, we spent a lot of time developing pretty elaborate joint development agreements and going out and looking for funding to support those. Uh, we talked a lot about future pricing models, but today it's really about negotiating commercial terms. It's about pricing, it's about warranties, and, and right now it's about really trying to figure out how to expedite materials to meet growing demand. So it's a, it's a really different, different situation. Um, on the hydrogen side, you know, a few years ago we really struggled to be able to figure out how to financially support the installation of infrastructure, we went to do early trials and demonstrations, but today, commercial customers are going out and on their own, they're going in and, uh, and they're, they're seeking multiple competitive bids for permanent installations at multiple sites and are doing this really without our involvement. And that's a really big shift and change. So, so today we're starting to see the successes is breeding more successes. And you know what I mean is that a couple of years ago, we started to offer products to customers where the price and the performance actually created value, and because of that, they started to buy more of our products. And it was that increasing volume that we were able to leverage, and we were able to improve our products and to lower our prices, and the customers started to buy more products. So that positive feedback loop is, is important, and then through that feedback loop, we're starting to approach what, you know, I'm gonna tell you now, it's the happy place. So that, the happy place, it was something as a, a previous colleague of mine back in Celex told me about it. It's that place where in the value chain, everybody's either getting good value for the money they're spending or they're making profit off the goods they're providing. And it's a sustainable place and it's a place where ultimately all companies need to get to. And, and like the island hopping concept, it emphasizes the need to keep the customer front and center in your thoughts. And the good thing here though is that everybody gets to share in a success. So, for myself, these changes are really exciting. They keep me in the game. Um, you know, although I think you said it's a life achievement award, I'm not leaving yet. <laughs> so I also know that uh, you know, I've talked about material handling, but you know, we're starting to also realize similar successes in stationary and in, in the mobile and the portable applications. And in each of these markets are being won over by the persistent efforts of other product development leaders who, like myself, are either too dedicated or too stubborn to, to give up. So I'm really proud, really happy to be selected for this award. I thank everybody. I'm, I'm passionate about this industry. Uh, I look forward to more and more successes, and I hope everyone else can start to feel this momentum is growing. So I uh, wish everybody great success, and thank you very much. Welcome, Frank Wolak, Fuel Cell Energy and member of the 2001 Fuel Cell Seminar Board of Directors. Good morning. I'd like to thank uh, Adrian for those uh, uh, words of encouragement, and I think we all realize that um, technology commercialization is a journey, and uh, success on that journey requires supporters as well as passion, and I'd like to first acknowledge our support. Uh, we'd like to thank Toyota for its support here at the Fuel Cell Seminar in 2011 for being a gold sponsor. Uh, Toyota has a uh, fuel cell vehicle here at the exhibit hall, and we encourage all of you to go and view it, touch it, don't kick it, but just enjoy the technology and marvel at it. And then there's passion, and I have the opportunity here to introduce uh, someone who we believe brings that kind of passion to this industry. Um, and that particular person is Jim Pies. 
Jim is Corporate Manager of Advanced Technology at Toyota Motor Sales USA. Jim oversees sales, marketing, business development, training, dealer relations, and long-term planning for vehicle electronics and telematics. He is tasked with developing and implementing future generations of in-vehicle electronics. He also oversees operations of Sirius XM satellite and other uh, subscriber services for Toyota Motor Sales. <coughs> In his 25 years at Toyota Motor Sales, Jim has held positions in sales, marketing, information systems, and strategic planning, and he's been responsible for bringing to market several Toyota Motor Sales technologies, including Toyota's first customer database, its first presence on the web with Toyota.com, Toyota Motor Sales' first corporate intranet, Toyota Vision, and Toyota Lexus dealer portal, Dealer Daily. Jim has received numerous awards in the area of direct marketing. He's also a contributing author for Net Success, which is published by Adams Media, and Wireless Rules, which is published by McGraw-Hill. He holds numerous patents in the fields of multimedia, electronics, and telematics. And in addition to the successes Jim has had at Toyota and his uh, success in the field of informatics, we, um, I personally, uh, I'm pleased to uh, uh, mention his uh, one accolade in life and that he's very heavily involved in the Boy Scouts of America. He holds the highest award for the Boy Scouts of America's National Office on Volunteerism and he also sits on the Orange County Board of Directors for the Boy Scouts of America. So with all of that cumulative passion, I bring to you Jim Pies and look forward to his comments. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Corporate Manager of Advanced Technology for Toyota Motor Sales USA, Jim Piaz. Toyota is the gold sponsor of the 2011... Well, thanks, Frank. Uh, that was quite, a, quite an introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here at the uh, happiest place on Earth. Talking technology, I know I've personally had many happy times here, including my honeymoon many, many moons ago. But uh, metaphorically, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey from t uh, Tomorrowland down Reality Road, and maybe if I'm lucky, we're, we're both lucky, we'll end up on Main Street, USA. But uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, as Frank told you, uh, I am a technologist working for uh, Toyota for more than 25 years, uh, and I have been delivering to Toyota many new technologies uh, as we go to launch. Uh, it makes me a little bit different than many of you who, he or who are here are engineers and scientists, and I'm really here to talk to you about the business of Fuel cell, fuel cell science. And uh, f first of all, th let me show you uh, what I'll be covering. We'll start off with the uh, technical challenges, some of which we've really overcome. Then I want to talk to you about the complexity in the marketplace and the, maybe the partnerships that are going to be needed to resolve some of those complexity. That will take us on a focus that uh, that I really want to talk about, a lot about, and that's our customer and the education and information that, that, that we'll need to keep, to keep them moving forward. And then the dealers, how do they fit into the equation? Finally, I'll take you a path forward. But let me start out by showing you a quick two-minute video that will remind you of Toyota's big picture uh, goals on the, going forward.
I love that video, and I want to thank the audio guys. A little bit heavy on the bass, kind of reminded me of a little bit of a Jay-Z concert, didn't it? Didn't it? But that video does inspire me to do the things that I do, and I have a story to tell you about the business part in driving sustainable development. And it starts with our common understanding that we are in a tough business, filled with complicated science and complex relationships. You know, fuel cell science is filled with chemistry and physics and other sciences where breakthroughs are defined with the next invention. And as we come to market with fuel cell transportation, we are understanding that un unusual new relationships have to be built. Complex relationships we don't fully understand with partners we have little experience with right now. And with that in mind, I can, I can say to you that perhaps the complicated nature of building sustainable mo uh, mobility really is only exceeded by the complex process of implementing it. Um, I'm going to let that th thought sink in for a moment for you. Because this idea, in my mind, lays the foundation for some of the business discussion I had here. But let's talk technology for a little bit, if we could. So building a fuel cell vehicle is complicated. The hydrogen tanks, the stack, the battery, electric motors, and all the IT to integrate it all. Uh, th through generations of fuel cell uh, electric vehicle, there have been many challenges that Toyota has faced. Our field testing has brought forth front and center issues related to durability, size, density, temperature performance, cruising range, and certainly cost. And via standard engineering processes, we have addressed these key areas one by one. So technology has progressed. Our current state reveals that the principal technologies have been invented. And most of the technical problems have market solutions. So where do we go from here? Embedded within the Toyota culture is the concept of Kaizen, or continuous improvement. And even though we've built a solid fuel cell product, improving quality and reducing cost will remain a fundamental effort for Toyota in the future. But just as we Kaizen the, the technical side, the business process must evolve as well. A recent McKenzie study stated that the focus has shifted, focus has shifted from demonstration to commercial deployment. So that fuel cell electric vehicles, like all technologies, may benefit from the mass production and economies of scale. To put it even a little more succinctly, we must now really prepare for the launch of fuel cell technology. You know, and of course, we, we can't do that single-handedly. So we will have multiple partners, each with their own subject matter expertise. Toyota, like all OEMs, will reach out to these partners. Some relationships may be formal, others may be a little bit less formal. Toyota's future success will rely on this interdependent partner network. So let's look at the marketplace. The diversity of partners and, ha and how they relate to one another is very complex. There is the government, the hydrogen providers, the regulators, energy companies, equipment providers, insurance companies, and oh yes, the car companies themselves. And some of these existing and new relationships are symbiotic, others are dependent, some may be mutually beneficial. However, the interdependence between partners is not really understood 
and it requires nurturing and study. We're working on that. We spend a significant amount of time analyzing the potential relationship consequences. And this complexity, frankly, is difficult for Toyota. So how do we deal with this complexity? Well, for decades, you know, what Toyota has been really good at is the automotive manufacturing. And what that has taught us is that to have that great automotive manufacturing, we really need solid client-vendor relationships. And really, just like a synchronized ballet, it's getting to know and trust your partners. The right partner doing the right moves is usually a good formula for success. And one of the first go-to-market challenges is the fundamental issue of infrastructure. The vehicle must have fuel to run, and fueling stations must have vehicles to operate. So the vehicles and the fueling really must arrive together. We need to take a new look at this problem. Moving forward requires an element of trust built upon business models that have solid returns. However, we know initial payback will take time. And not every return on investment should be measured in the short term. All partners are needed. No one can sit on the sidelines and wait. We must all mitigate the risk and together intelligently move forward. It means new dependencies will form, some of which will challenge old business models. As an example, energy companies have provided the fuel for U.S. transportation for a long time. The U.S. The population really depends upon them. They have scale and processes, plans that enable them to move forward, but their structure and their very profitable business model is all about petroleum and its various forms. However, as we all know, fuel cells need hydrogen. Although hydrogen is used in the refining petroleum products, it isn't really produced by the, en the energy companies. It's really produced by the hydrogen providers. So how can these groups best work together? Combining the distribution system of energy providers and the hydrogen fuel production capability of hydrogen providers paves the way for the next fueling revolution. We all see this, but when and how? To achieve harmony and bring these groups together, there must be an alignment of goals. And there must be an alignment of goals throughout this industry. As we move forward, these companies will, sh will share a common focus that they don't share today. We know all of the key groups, right? Government, manufacturers, regulators, distributors, suppliers. What is the unseen connection that is shared by all of these groups? It is the thing that will help us work best together. At the end of the day, the customer is in the intersection. They will decide our success by opening their wallets. They will choose a fuel cell vehicle. They will choose a distribution channel and the hydrogen to, to, to fuel them. Or they won't. The convenience and ease by which we sell vehicles and fuel them will play a major part in advancing the market. So how do we get the customers to consider purchasing a fuel cell vehicle? Toyota has asked. 
Toyota has asked its customers what's important. And the response is really not unexpected. There are many things on the minds of fuel, uh, future fuel cell vehicle owners. And three of their top concerns are uh, efficiency, not just in fuel economy, but also in total cost of ownership. And being green is a big bonus. Also, reliability. Customer wants the quality and durability, and customers never want to think about, will it work today? And accessibility was very high on their list. You know, trade-offs can be acceptable, but too, mo too much modification of a customer's behavior will turn many customers off. Infrastructure plays a big role here. So what can we deliver on these requests? What, what, the things that they want, what can we deliver really right out of the gate? To start with, customers can really rely on some dramatic changes to their ownership experience. Well, fuel efficiency that exceeds twice that of a traditional internal combustion engine. And that fuel doesn't come from an overseas source. Emissions, yes, emissions that'll make a customer proud to drive that vehicle and a driver experience that is quieter and comfortable with driving dynamics remarkably similar to the vehicles that are on the road today. We believed, Toyota believes, the deliverables are sizable. And the hydrogen brand story is significant, although not completely defined yet. But to be sure, there are some gaps between what was requested by our customer, and what we can deliver at right out of the gate. So to help, we must educate the customers about fuel cell technology in a broad number of ways. So I drive a hydrogen vehicle every day, have for quite a while. So I have a, a lot of firsthand experience but back when I first started driving that hydrogen vehicle, there were many, many questions asked. You know, my, my curious neighbors, friends, family, is hydrogen safe? How much does it cost? How does it run without a motor? Does it need an oil change? How long will it last? And those weren't even the crazy questions. You know the, the, you know, the crazy ones are unbelievable. People in my neighborhood and in parking lots everywhere still stop me and, and all the time. They're asking me questions incessantly. And uh, so think of the questions I just, I just mentioned to you. And uh, think about trying to answer them in scale, you know. That's a gigantic job, and there really is more education that we, we need. So when customers are in the serious stages of consideration, there will be specific questions whose answers will determine the actual purchase decision. Questions related to top speed, refueling, and probably the most important and my favorite is how much will I have to change to accommodate your vehicle? So here's an example of some of the discussions you might hear if you were a fly on the wall in one of our dealerships. No, sir, we don't make fuel cell vehicles with the top end speed of a big V8. But let me remind you of the environmental aspects of, the, of this vehicle and the, the two times fuel efficiency. Or, Yes, ma'am, the fuel tank range on our fuel cells are comparable to gasoline models, but the station distribution is not. So driving will be limited, at least uh, to the clustered areas where hydrogen stations uh, are located. But let me show you where they are on the map. Or, yes, sir, there is a different fuel fueling process for fuel cell vehicles. 
The fuel is safer, virtually non-toxic compared to gasoline. However, fueling with a gas instead of a liquid will be a new experience for you. But not to worry, it's easy. So these are the kinds of conversations that we expect our 14,000 salespeople that they will have to have with future fuel cell customers. So a great deal of training is going to be needed across the country. So we will begin to educate ourselves with lessons learned from the sale of our Prius plug-in vehicles, which, which go on sale right after the first of the year. Uh, Prius, Prius plug-ins will have some of the same challenges. Now, for those customers who aren't sure about fuel cell versus other alternative drive uh, trains, more information will be needed. Overall, with the new powertrains coming out, customers will have more to consider, uh, and there'll be many more trade-offs. In 2011, Toyota customers really only consider a standard internal combustion engine and its hybrid variants. In just a few years, though, the customer will have to consider gasoline, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, battery electric, and fuel cell electric vehicles. And that's not even to mention diesel. Um, so the proper consideration of that mix will add even more complexity. So how will we help customers deal with all these questions and unknowns ahead in a pain-free manner? Well, the answer is our dealers. Dealers handle the last mile of contact with, the, with customers for Toyota. And although they are not now, will be an important part of the fuel cell ecosystem. Toyota doesn't own or operate any of these dealerships in the United States. So our in independent dealers will be on the front line with customers in sales and later on with service. Therefore, educating the dealer body and bringing them up to speed on fuel cell technology, giving them the right tools is really critical for, our, for success. In the future, dealers and vehicle manufacturers will have to embrace technology change in new and different ways. Dealerships are already adapting to the Apple Genius Bar model within dealerships, dedicating teams of staff members to explain how vehicle technology works. Toyota and Lexus also have connected vehicle telematic systems and programs that allow for up-to-date communications and information to flow into vehicles in real time. We'll use that to, to help customers under, understand. These tools and others will be critical elements to facilitate the training of customers. There's much work going forward with our dealers, and the timeline starts in just a few months, in 2012. So what are we going to do? What's going to go on? So we've been working on the fuel cell, the vehicle itself, system engineering for years. And we'll continue to do that. Continuous technical improvement and cost reductions will move forward. But we are now at a point where we are preparing to launch these fuel cell vehicles. And as part of these efforts, we'll be working on new projects, such as developing new infrastructure partnerships. And, and we're very open to new ideas. We'll be working with dealers on facility standards. You know, we're going to have to change some of the standards at the dealerships, 1,400 of them around the country. And we're going to have to do some early education to get them to understand the basic concepts around hydrogen. We will prepare the, the greater Toyota enterprise, educate our Toyota associates 
and formulate our plans to educate the dealer body. We'll begin the lengthy process of developing the hydrogen brand. That's a big deal. And all the related marketing activities that, are, that surround that brand making. In our sales planning process, we'll begin to focus on selecting initial rollout areas. So as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, the complicated nature of building sustainable mobility is only exceeded by the complex process of implementing it. I hope you get a sense of what I mean by this by the last few, by the last few slides that I've had. Now just a, a few final thoughts. Fuel cell technology is rapidly maturing. Toyota needs the benefit of mass production and economies of scale to make fuel cell vehicles economical for all. Collaboration and partnerships are critical, especially in the area of infrastructure. New ideas from government regulators, businesses are needed and wanted. You can rely on Toyota, and I'll speak for my other, uh, for all of the other industry brands, really, to have their respective dealer bodies ready. We'll have all the materials and tools to sell and service fuel cell vehicles. It'll be a big job, but we've really done that before. And as we proceed, we need to remember that the customer the customer is the common bond between just about everyone in this room. Whether it may not be today, but it, it will be. We should take steps with our partnerships to understand and embrace this customer dynamic. So there is still work to be done. I am confident that we evolve to the business side of fuel, fuel cell science that our hard work will pay dividends. So thank you very much for your attention and your time. Appreciate it. Treasurer of the 2011 Fuel Cell Seminar Board of Directors, Larry Blair. Interesting. We were told at breakfast this morning that was the voice of God that we were hearing uh, here. And I told Shannon a, a little while ago, I noticed God's voice is feminine, and there must be some significance to that. And she said, what else would you expect? But anyway, thanks, Jim, for your presentation. Um, I've made this offer before, but if you um, are looking for customer trials, uh, I'm, I'm available and I'll give you my address and you can deliver one of those uh, new vehicles to me. But we do definitely appreciate the, the leadership role that Toyota is playing in fuel cell for transportation applications. And uh, now on to our next speaker who's Dr. Klaus Bonhoff. Klaus received his uh, PhD in uh, 1998 in energy process engineering. He's worked at uh, Ballard, Ballard Power Systems and Daimler Chrysler in various fuel cell activities. And Klaus is uh, currently the managing director of NOW, the German National Organization for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology. The title of his presentation today is Hydrogen in a Changing Energy World. Dr. Bonhoeffer. Thank you, Larry, for the introduction. Good morning. It's a great honor to speak here this morning, and I really would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about hydrogen fuel cell activities in Germany, but more broader than that, maybe a little bit about the energy system in Germany and the, the, the discussions that we recently have on changing that energy system. Because the world is changing constantly. Almost 10 years ago, 
we had a very detailed discussion on a national fuels strategy. And the question really was, what are the technologies to do three things at the same time? To increase the efficiency in transportation, to reduce the emissions, and to have a more diversified fuel portfolio or energy portfolio. This is how really the uh, beyond the R&D that was ongoing in Germany, the uh, NIP, the National Innovation Program on Hydrogen Fuel Cell Technologies got started because hydrogen in that assessment is one of the most promising candidates when it comes to fulfilling these three goals. So we started to not only do R&D, but to say, well, we need more experience, hands-on experience with hydrogen as a fuel. Yes, it is a commodity in the chemical industry for quite a while, but it's not a fuel that uh, where a customer is used to, to using it. So we, we need experience on that, and that's how really we got started on our program that I will talk about in more detail in a little while. Today, we have a even broader discussion in Germany on our energy system, and we call this the Energiewende, which basically means completely changing the energy system that we have in Germany. And now I'm not only talking about mobility, I'm really talking about the energy system as a whole. And to be fair, the uh, public discussion is more on the stationary side, and people have not yet fully understood that transportation really is part of the energy system. One third of the primary energy used in Germany and elsewhere in the world, I guess, uh, goes into transportation. But we're talking about completely changing the energy system. And this is uh, not only, but also because of the uh, recent events we saw in Japan uh, with Fukushima. And uh, in Germany, we have taken, our government has taken, and society has really taken a decision to fade out of nuclear energy. And the goal now is uh, that by 2022, we will no more rely on nuclear power, but we really have a, an energy system that uh, basically relies on, in the end, renewable energies. So when we talk about changing the energy system, we really talk about three things. It's saving energy, which of course is important. It's about efficiency, and it is about the increase of the share of renewable energies. So Germany has set a goal to have, by 2020, 35% of the power sector being fed by or using renewable energies. And it's 80%, the share of renewable energies is supposed to be 80% in 2050. Those are challenging goals, and we have to think about how to meet them. Uh, specifically on transportation, the German government has set a goal to reduce energy consumption in the transportation sector by 40% until 2050. And this vis-a-vis -vis a growing demand in the mobility sector, not necessarily on individual mobility, but uh, looking at goods transport, looking at uh, aviation, uh, we see a rising demand. So nevertheless, the goal is to reduce the energy consumption in the transportation sector by 40%. Germany is part of Europe. The EU white paper on transportation that was published uh, some time ago, and which is under discussion, so this is not confirmed. This is uh, being discussed in 27 member states now. But the, the, energy, the uh, commission in, in Brussels put forward uh, basically the goal to decarbonize the transportation sector by 2050. And also they were talking about, or they are talking about, uh, other policy measures such as banning internal combustion engines from inner cities uh, as early as 2030. So this sets the frame when I now talk about hydrogen and fuel cell technologies, and we all know that hydrogen and fuel cell technologies are needed in such, a, uh, such an energy system um, in the stationary energy sector as well as in the transportation sector. Uh, I would like to focus in my um, presentation, in my talk, on four topics. Um, to start with, I would like to give you a little more insight into our innovation program, the NIP, the National Innovation Program in Hydrogen and Fuel Cells, and talk about the current status. Uh, and the second topic, I would like to go into some more detail on the role hydrogen can play in such a changing energy system. The third topic would be about next steps. Where are we today? But it is important to think about how can we move forward. And I, Jim, I think Jim said uh, the scene already uh, perfectly, saying in partnership we need to move forward to get 
really these technologies into the market and have the impact of those technologies that uh, we expect. The fourth topic I'm going to touch upon is the international context and some of the activities that are happening uh, worldwide. As I said, almost 10 years ago, we started to discuss a program for hydrogen filter technologies. We had for decades uh, R&D focused activities in our national labs and companies, but really around 2003 based on that fuel strategy and then it took until 2006 where we defined a program with two foci. One was on still continued R&D, focusing on the issues you very well know, which is durability, reliability, and reducing cost, uh, but also focusing really on demonstration. So the German government took a decision to invest into demonstration activities, and the Ministry of Transportation dedicated into a 10-year program 500 million euro of funding, uh, and we had an ongoing R&D funding of around about 20 million per year, so this adds up in a 10-year program to 700 million euro in public funding, assuming that industry would match this funds, uh, these, these funds. And uh, so that in the end, we're talking about a 1.4 billion program, uh, which runs until the end of 2016. That's the plan for right now. So far, um, and this is now focusing on the demonstration activities, uh, we've dedicated uh, 260 million euro already of those 500 million into existing projects. So after three years, four years in the program, uh, we've dedicated half, more than half of the money, uh, which clearly shows that despite the very challenging times that industry had, especially over the last two years, industry is still developing this technology and moving it forward into the market um, and, and really getting from from uh, R&D to demonstration to deployment. 50% of our program is dedicated towards transportation, around about one third is towards fuel cells in the stationary energy sector, and around about 10% is on what we call special markets, uh, which does include material handling, forklifts, which also includes backup power. The way we structure our program is basically in so-called lighthouse projects. So we make sure that individual projects are clustered so that people work together on the challenges that they all have. Of course, there is proprietary information within each project, but nevertheless, there are shared concerns when it comes to cost reduction, when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to safety, when it comes to regulations and all these things. So we need to make sure that the uh, respective industries work together to then successfully be able to, to commercialize. In the transportation sector, our big lighthouse project is the CEP, the Clean Energy Partnership. Uh, and this is really about the deployment of fuel cell vehicles, passenger cars, as well as fuel cell buses in various cities. Over the years, the CEP grew. We have a fuel cell vehicle demonstration today in Berlin, in Hamburg in the Cologne-Düsseldorf area, in the Frankfurt area, as well as in the Stuttgart area. Uh, and this goes along, of course, with the appropriate infrastructure. We have either already installed or right now been uh, commissioned uh, 15 public hydrogen stations, 700 bar stations when it comes to passenger cars, 350 bars when it comes to fuel cell buses. And these 15 stations are publicly accessible. They are right on the same uh, facility as, as regular fueling stations. Um, and we're operating those vehicles and customers are operating these vehicles to gather experiences and to not only look at the technical issues but also look at the non-technical issues that are associated with this. Uh, again, which is around safety and approvals but which also is about customer acceptance which is a key point. Uh, when it comes to the stations, we're looking at different pathways. The CEP has set itself a goal to have 50% of the hydrogen in the program coming from renewable energies. So there's a clear pathway towards using renewable energies for driving uh, fuel cell vehicles in the transportation market. When it comes to stationary fuel cells, we have a program on uh, CHP, Residential Combined Heat and Power Units. Uh, we call our lighthouse project Calux. Um, and it's basically, the
the same attempt. Take the technology, bring it into the houses of the people, operate it, and uh, well, learn by operating these units uh, in a day-to-day -day operation. Uh, the plan is to have up to 800 uh, of these units in the field by 2015. Uh, we're looking at different technologies. We have low temperature PEM, we have high temperature PEM, we have uh, SOFC. So uh, depending on really the company that is in, uh, involved or is, is developing the technology, they've set uh, or they've decided on, on different technologies. But we're testing all of them to uh, really identify the, the, the challenges uh, to commercialize this. We're looking into fuel cells for onboard supply on ships and yachts, so uh, big units uh, to not, um, not for the drivetrain or not to propel the ship, but actually as an onboard uh, power supply. We're looking into hydrogen fuel cells at airports, material handlings, for example. Uh, and just recently, we uh, founded a uh, lighthouse project on backup power. Uh, which is called clean power net. So uh, within telecommunication, data centers, these kind of activities, these kind of uh, installations, of course, reliable power is important, and this is where fuel cells play an important role as well. Um, so these are just some, some examples of what we do in the program and, and how we really uh, do R&D and demonstration to move these things forward to learn how to commercialize and to, in partnership, develop things forward. The basis for our program is a development plan which was agreed upon by industry, academia, and politics. And we're actually right now in the process of updating this plan. Um, so we, uh, one of the major points we do change now in, in our new system is that we put more emphasis really on hydrogen production and on renewable hydrogen production. Uh, this was part of the transportation activities so far, but we really take, took it out of the transportation and said, well, there's more to it, and, and uh, I'll come to that in a minute. When we talk about hydrogen from renewable energy sources, we need key technologies, uh, especially electrolyzer technologies, uh, but also biomass gasification to actually um, make this happen. So let me just take a minute to talk about uh, NOW as an organization that you might not be familiar with. Uh, we were actually founded to actually run this program, to make sure that all these activities are aligned, that people from different industries, from academia and industry and politics, work together uh, to, to move these things forward. And next to the hydrogen fuel cell program, our organization is also managing the big program from the Ministry of Transportation on battery electric technologies um, or battery uh, electric uh, drivetrains. So we're doing both. We're looking into hydrogen fuel cells, but also into, of course, battery uh, technology. And we do believe that it is this portfolio approach that we need in order to meet the challenges when it comes to future sustainable transportation. Now let me come to the second topic, which is hydrogen in the context of changing the energy system. And uh, again, hydrogen as a fuel is important, uh, and it will be important to meet the upcoming regulations. I mean, the OEMs do have to fulfill and comply with existing regulation, and this is in Germany or for Europe, uh, CO2 regulation. Um, and the goals are, we're today at an average of around about 160 gram uh, CO2 per kilometer. The goal is by 2015 to get down to 120. 2020 is being discussed to reach 95 grams per kilometer. Uh, and then you get to the limit of what you can achieve with incumbent technologies, what you can achieve by improving internal combustion engines, by integrating uh, biofuels into the portfolio. Uh, and then looking forward, uh, and again towards 2050, minus 80% on CO2, we do need zero emission technology, and I think that one chart that Jim showed from that EU study is quite uh, impressive. Uh, you cannot achieve, in the complexity that mobility has, you cannot achieve zero emission mobility without fuel cells and without hydrogen uh, derived from renewable energy. So it needs to be part of their portfolio, and, and this is why we're uh, actively working on this to, to make this happen. And, uh, as Jim pointed out, to, to Toyota's plans, we know about other OEMs that are as engaged as that uh, to really start commercialization uh, as early as 2014, in some of the announcements, 2015, 2016 timeframe, is when we see those vehicles coming into the market. 
The discussion around hydrogen really picked up in Germany, at least, um, when it came to increasing the share of renewables in our energy system. Uh, this year, we have around about 20% of the power produced by renewable energies in Germany. 35% uh, would be the goal, again, for, for 2020, and 80% for 2050. Now, this would mean for Germany, specifically, a sharp increase, especially of wind capacity. Wind power is the predominant renewable energy source that we use in our energy system, next to some geothermal, some photovoltaic, but really wind power is where we have the most potential uh, to, to you know, get to these high shares of renewable energies. But now these renewable energies are fluctuating energies, as you all know. So uh, you need to somehow match uh, the energy input that comes from the wind or the sun and th the demand side on the other side. Now, grid capacity plays a key role, but we do know that we cannot increase the capacity uh, to actually manage these large uh, capacities of fluctuating energies. Demand side management is important. So we're, yes, we are talking about smart grids. Uh, to somehow direct power to where it can be best used or uh, at, at the time. But beyond this, and this is what our large utilities tell us, we do need storage. Uh, we need to have storage facilities, and, and when it comes to storage, is, uh, it's a, again a quite complex field of technology. Uh, it's from small amounts of energies to large amounts of energies. It's to store over a short period of time, all the way up to storing energy for weeks and months. Now, in that picture, yes, we talk about uh, can we use batteries in vehicles to somehow you know, do some storage or at least do some stabilization of the fre frequency in the net. Uh, yes, we are talking about hydropower. Uh, yes, we are talking about compressed air storage. But then when it really comes to large amounts of energy, needing to be stored over longer periods of time, people do talk about hydrogen. So all of a sudden, there is a political awareness uh, and an industrial interest in producing hydrogen out of renewables and storing that hydrogen to then use it for, for different purposes. And of course, uh, staying within the power sector, you would like to repower the hydrogen uh, and put it back into either a gas turbine or a fuel cell to provide power to the grid. Uh, but once you have produced this renewable hydrogen, you might as well think about, well, using this renewable hydrogen for the transportation sector. And this is where it becomes really interesting because now all of a sudden we're connecting two different industries that so far historically have not a lot to do one with the other. One is the stationary energy sector and the other one is the transportation sector. And here we have hydrogen as the link in between these two industries uh, to get renewable power into the tank, into the vehicle, and that's where we need it to get to sustainable mobility. So around this, we're now developing a set of uh, different projects and uh, different activities, different industries coming together, um, really making sure that in partnership that opportunity is being used. The third topic I want to talk about is what are next steps? I've talked about the activities that we're doing and the political situation, but what are really concrete next steps to move things forward? And I would like to highlight um, two activities. One is on the stationary fuel cell side and the other one is on the hydrogen infrastructure side. Uh, b before I go there, I think it is important to remind ourselves what we have achieved over the last five to 10 years. 10 years ago, uh, people were looking at this technology saying, well, will they ever come up with the lifetime required, with the durability? Will they ever be able to reduce the cost to the level where it needs to be uh, to commercialize? Uh, and I think there are a lot of examples out there clearly showing that in some markets already we have achieved that. And when it comes to the more demanding markets as transportation or stationary fuel cells, uh, we're, we're getting there. And there's clear pathways from the OEMs, from the supply industry, to really get fuel cells to where you need them to have in terms of uh, the performance uh, things I've mentioned. Now, stationary fuel cells, of course, fuel cells are highly efficient, and uh, if you do combined heat and power, you get more actually out of your, out of your fuel. 
Uh, we have demonstration programs. Japan has a very strong program on really taking it one step further. Um, thousands of units in the field, government subsidies being available to support the end customer to actually buying those units and deploying them in their households. And this is something that we're looking into in Germany in more detail. How would you actually uh, kind of shape governmental instruments, government support, to make sure that you get those units into the field? Because yes, in the beginning, there is a cost delta that needs to be covered. Uh, but at the same time, we need the technology to meet our long-term policy goals. So there's good arguments for uh, for governments to actually support market introduction of these technologies. When it comes to hydrogen infrastructure, we started an initiative in 2009 in Germany, which is called H2 Mobility. Uh, and this really combines the gas industry, the oil industry, and the utilities, together with the OEMs, to analyze in more detail the commercial rollout of a widespread area-wide hydrogen infrastructure in Germany. So in 2009, uh, infrastructure companies signed an MOU saying we want to commonly or jointly uh, understand the facts and figures behind this. How many stations, uh, when, where, how supplied, uh, what's the hydrogen production portfolio, what's the CO2 footprint associated with that, uh, and of course, linking all this with the cost figures to eventually come up with a business plan for a rollout of hydrogen infrastructure in Germany. Now that process is still ongoing. Our target is at the end of this year to have a uh, say master plan in place to step by step build up hydrogen stations over the next 10-15 years. Um, there were some figures uh, here and there publicly mentioned um, the industry group said, well, so far, let's keep the figures, you know, in our group to, uh, un until, we absolutely, uh, until we're absolutely sure how we can move this forward. But it would take around about 1,500 hydrogen fueling stations in Germany to really give the customer the perception of hydrogen is widely available. We have 14,000 regular gasoline hydrogen station, uh, gasoline stations, uh, but 1,500 hydrogen stations well-placed would be sufficient to really uh, give the customer uh, a good feeling to actually walk into the showroom, buy a fuel cell vehicle, and knowing how, where to refuel it. Uh, the, the investment for you know, these stations would be probably in the order of 1.5 to 2 billion euro, but here we're talking about a rollout over 10 to 15 years. Um, and the tricky situation we're all facing is, we know and we understand from the figures that long term there is a business case uh, to invest into hydrogen, to invest into the infrastructure, to invest into the stations, to invest into even renewable hydrogen production facilities. Uh, the, the tricky thing is now, how do you trigger that investment? Because the first five years uh, are not profitable, because stations will be underutilized to start with. So this is the situation we're facing, and this is where we try, in partnership with government, with uh, industry, uh, to, to analyze the situation and, and define step-by-step step things forward. And we will see more stations in our demonstration programs uh, as we move towards 2015 to make sure that an initial hydrogen infrastructure is available for the early rollout of the vehicles. We're also looking in H2 mobility into uh, things as metering, um, hydrogen quality, uh, approvals. Uh, yes, there are issues around this and there are technical questions that still need to be answered, uh, but the industry involved is very positive that these challenges uh, can actually be overcome. Now let me move to the fourth topic I wanted to mention, which is the international context and the international cooperation that is needed. Uh, Germany is not an island, we are part of Europe, so naturally we're discussing with our friends in, in Brussels, and they have similar programs in place. Um, not saying that it's always easy to discuss these things uh, in a political arena, but uh, there's a clear path forward in Brussels as well to make sure